Oh yeah, that's a good bird. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> oh, I don't like him. What's up guys? Back at home in North Carolina. Really excited for this YouTube video. I've actually got to help me mason jar of coffee. So you know it's real. But gonna sit down with my brother learn all of kind of what he's about i really look up to him my family's been a huge inspiration to me helping me kind of go out there live this life in common chase whatever i want to do crazy things so my brother secretly i admire a whole ton i look up to him and the stuff that he's done is just incredible so hopefully we can learn a little bit about from him uh, but more importantly look at the background so if you don't want to be a dolphin trainer or train falcons or hawks what can we learn something from these people and how do we translate that to living our life? So that's what I'm all about, helping you guys chase yours. Hope you guys enjoy. Um, all right, so if someone was wanting to get into uh, falconry or they see a State Farm commercial and they think it's funny to, to train a, a falcon or a hawk, you mentioned the apprentice or the falconers association that you were a part of. Mm. Uh, what does it take to even, before you even get started training a hawk, what, is it, what do you have to do? Um, well, it's a very long process and it's something that you have to invest a lot of time in. Even before you get to be a part of a bird's life, um, you know, it's not something you can just go out there and do. Uh, falconry is very old and it's a very respected tradition um, throughout the ages. So in the States, um, you have to go through the Fish and Wildlife Program. You have to be licensed. They check out all your gear um, and they regulate uh, what we do. So you've got it and it's completely wild. Uh, it's never really interacted with humans probably, if so limited. What are like the four steps, um, or if you could get into like three or four steps, because I know you sit around with it just to get acclimated. So what are the what kind of steps? Um, how do you progress to where you can kind of let it off in a tree and for it to come back? Well, the basic thing is, is to gain that relationship of trust. I mean, it's just like meeting somebody for the first time. And I think what a lot of people don't understand is they, they make it species specific. You know, they talk about the bird or they talk about dogs or they talk about cats, but it really is easier than that. It's just about an individual. You learn that individual's behaviors. You learn what makes them work, what they seem to enjoy, what they don't seem to enjoy. And you want to gain that relationship of trust so that they want to spend time with you. And so the first you know, few weeks or after you, tra after you trap a bird, again, this is through Fish and Wildlife. This is all licensed through them. So we do have a season where we can go out and trap and it's a lot like fishing. Um, and once you do that, you can spend time with them and get to know them. And it's just like sitting here with you. You know, they sit on the glove and they're learning to trust us and we are learning to trust them because they can hurt me just as easily as I could hurt them. I mean, those claws are very sharp, and if she wanted to come at my face or your face right now, there's not a whole lot of distance between the two of us. No, so you kind of get acclimated, you build that trust, and then do you just kind of let it up in a tree, or how do you, how does that kind of work come yeah. about? Over time, you, you take small steps. Some people call them baby steps, but what you would do is you would, distance this the, you would put more distance in between the two of you and and work with that distance so that you know at first you're on the couch and you just have a little bit of rope in between the two of you when I mean, you can see I've got a little bit of rope here um, and you would just get further and further away so you'd set it on the back of a chair like we're sitting on and you would go a step back and have it come to you and if that doesn't work then you would take a step backwards and not physically but in training you would take a step back and you would start from the basics again and try to build that trust up. Um, I guess the best way to describe that is kind of like dating. You know, you don't just start off with somebody and get married. I mean, some people do. That doesn't tend to work very you well. You don't hit a home run. You uh, you get to first base or something. Yeah, you get to second base. You have you hit to a take double. the bases in order because <laughs> if you don't, the relationship doesn't usually. Uh, so go you very can't well. get a second base on the first date. Is that what you're trying to say? Um, it's better uh, with training. Unless the bird 
uh, allows you to do so. That's probably not a good idea to force your way in. Um, I don't know. She, she, she agrees. I don't know anything about dating. Um, I So kind of like basketball, if you were to start with layups and kind of move way back before you start shooting threes almost, you got to right. get comfortable. Yeah, you have to learn how to get the ball in the hole first. <laughs> Uh, that's the most important thing is getting the ball in the hole. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when it comes to animals, or I guess specifically hawks, what are mm -hmm. the biggest misconceptions, um, you know, with training, you know, a hawk or an animal? Well, I think the, the biggest misconception is that there's one right way to do it. And, you know, the, the saying goes that you can put, um, you know, a bunch of trainers in the room, but the only thing that they're going to agree upon is what the other trainers are doing wrong. So. There are multiple different ways to train an individual animal and it really needs to be tailored to that individual. So even if we had another Harris Hawk, which this one is, um, you know, doesn't mean that they would train the same way. So uh, a dog, all dogs don't train the same way. Any dog trainer will know that. Any, all kids don't train the same way and it really works the same with birds. Cool. Um, and then I guess what is the coolest story uh, you've had or seen um, in your experience with training animals? And this can be anything with a hawk or back in when you were with uh, dolphins, but kind of what's the coolest thing uh, that you were like, holy shit, like that's kind of cool. Well, I don't know as far as anything that I've done or seen done, but I mean the coolest things is how that we can use their abilities to help us as a society. Um, if you look at um, what, you know, sometimes the government likes to do with dolphins and marine mammals as far as using them in their Navy program to assist our armed forces, and that's pretty amazing. Um, you you got to give a lot of credit to therapy dogs and uh, people who train those. That's a lot of times much cooler than training these birds because those are helping people every day get past what some would consider disabilities um, and allow them to be a little more functional, I guess you could say, in society and get through their life where, whereas they couldn't without them. Yeah. Um, and real quick, I think this is an important question. What is, a lot of people see an animal in a cage or, you know, if you were to see it kind of sitting over there in your yard um, and kind of feel bad for it. Um, what is the benefits, uh, and I know a little bit about this, but you can speak to it better. What are the benefits of, uh, of this girl right here? So why is she gaining from kind of being, you know, in your presence? And are you going to let her go? Or Well, it, it's hard because a lot of people put a lot of motion into what they see at face value. And they don't think about the history of an individual or they don't think about... Um, you know the consequences of what freeing an individual would entail so if you look at this bird at first glance I mean you see that uh, she's got feathers coming out she looks kind of raggedy right now she's t attached to a line and she likes to vocal from time to time which some people would say scream so automatically if you take that in a human perspective you would say she's chained up and she's been mistreated or she's angry and that doesn't necessarily follow from what we know these signs to entail as to what they know these signs to entail. So she's going through molt, she's losing some of her feathers. Some of them have been trashed because we flew so hard during the hunting season that, you know, as a juvenile bird, she would, um, you know, sit on her tail a lot and she would break those feathers. And so we've done everything we can to make sure that those feathers don't completely get destroyed and that they allow the new feathers to come in with the proper support. Also the line um, that we work with is as much for her protection as for ours. Is, is kind of from what I understand the Falconers Association like getting a hawk if it's a wild one or not one part is education so you do want to kind of inform the public to, to kind of better their lives overall mm -hmm. but then uh, for each individual is the main goal to kind of give them skills and tool sets to get out in the world to kind of be able to survive in the wild or is it always going to be you know captive well it depends on what kind of bird you're working with or what kind of animal you're working with whether that's a kid or a bird um you know the ones that we trap uh they do have a 
30, 25-30% survival rate. So 70 to 75, 80% of those first year birds are going to die um, statistically uh, from the reports and, and statistics. Um, that means that we are able to help those birds that we trap out in the wild and teach to hunt in a way and, and help them through that first winter. We can release them uh, to where they're better off um, as part of the reproducing population in the wild. As a kid being interested to kind of going out and actually, you know, training dolphins to where everyone just goes to the parks and sees these dolphin trainers and says like, oh, that's, that's cool, I want to do that. And they go home and it's completely back to normal life and they, they don't ever, it's, it's just an idea that flashes in their head and they never actually go to the process and, you know, through these apprenticeship programs. So. Um, through your experience in doing all this and kind of chasing your dreams, what, what does it mean to live a life uncommon? Well, I would say it's not necessarily, you know, don't be afraid of going back to the normal way of, of life because everybody has these dreams. Everybody has these ideas of, you know, what would be awesome to do in life and then it is merely a flash and they think that because they went back to the normal way of life, they can't get obtain that dream or that goal. So the thing is to not let those those dreams die and realize that there's a time and place for everything and just because you are in what you would consider a normal mundane life at the time doesn't mean that tomorrow you can't wake up and have the opportunity to do that. It's all about keeping that dream alive and being able to see when the time is opportune to seize that moment and to make that happen. Cool. Um, and then if you could leave everyone or even myself, uh, what is one thing that everyone can do to, to either chase that dream and to kind of live this life uncommon? Um, I, I think it, it's just don't be afraid to take chances. You know, when you see that moment, take it. If it